Hi, everyone. Welcome to our fourth virtual and evening edition of If Cars Could Talk. We are very excited to host this program for you to enjoy. And now from the comfort of your own home, what could be better? Um, my name is Kelsey Cross, and I am the education coordinator of LeMay America's Car Museum. For upcoming If Cars Could Talk and educational programs, please visit our website and subscribe to the museum's newsletter for the most up-to-date information. Everything can be found in those places. Um, before we get started um, talking about all of the fun stuff and learning more about the past and future of Cadillac, I do have a few quick housekeeping rules um, just to get us started. So first one, if you have any questions, there are a couple of options for you. So you are more than welcome to use the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom portion of your screen. There should be a little bar there um, in between participants and Q&A. Um, there should be a box there that you can type your questions into. For this presentation, um, our speaker does not mind answering questions periodically throughout the talk, so you do not have to save them towards the end if you would rather ask them mid-presentation. I will monitor the Q&A box, so please specify if you want your question answered during the discussion or if you would like it at the end. Additionally, you can also ask your question by using the raise hand icon and we will call on you and ask you when it's your turn. So you have a few different options there to ask your questions. If you're having any technical issues, please type those into the chat box also located down at the bottom of your screen next to the Q&A, and I will answer them as quickly as possible for you. This presentation also is being recorded, so please feel free to share this video once we have it on our website and YouTube channel with family and friends who are unable to attend. And of course, have fun. This is what it's all about, and hopefully this is content that you enjoy and it's something to do on a Tuesday night. So thank you all again so much for being patient. I know some of you got here pretty early. We really appreciate you. Um, thank you again for attending this evening. So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker and curator of exhibitry, Scott Keller, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the past and future of Cadillac tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening, everybody. Um, and then I'll also add to the, the offer to say that um, tonight we're going to talk about the um, uh, Cadillac exhibit at the museum. It's the uh, one of the uh, newest exhibits that we did. Of course, now we're talking about many, many months of, of um, uh, everything being closed and furlough and so on. So I am more than happy to answer questions about current and future exhibits um, or just anything that you that it crosses your mind with regard to the audience experience. So um, I'm going to proceed with this ex um, uh, presentation that I put together on the Cadillac exhibit and I look forward to any feedback or questions that you have along the way including well that helped but I need some technical assistance are you um, hitting the next slide button on there and it's not moving forward I'm hitting my return slide my shift slide okay so the uh, right yes please Use um, their arrow buttons yes. on the bottom uh, right portion of your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and use the um, the one furthest to the right for yeah, next. I'm, I'm getting the no, it's not. Right. Okay, in that case, try um, using your mouse and just clicking the screen. Okay, got it. Thank you for the tip. Um, okay, um, again, to, to um, follow up on what I said, that uh, the exhibit we're talking about now is um, um, the Cadillac Center of the World exhibit. Uh, and this, for everybody, um, anybody that's not had a chance to see it yet, is the um, very first, uh, excuse me, the second exhibit that you see when you walk in our showcase gallery. So if you imagine the big space on the uh, upper floor where you look outside in the beautiful um, uh, um, view of Tacoma, this is that exhibit. You will have walked through, and I'm happy to answer questions on any exhibit, the Selene exhibit. Um, what we're doing as a museum right now is kind of recalibrating how many exhibits are up, what our new ones are going to be. We um, keep an eye on the website um, or contact me at the museum anytime. 
um, during the week. And I can, I can walk you through you know, the status of everything. Um, we have quite a few exhibits. Many of them are new. Many of them have some exciting um, um, upgrades that are going to occur. So today we're gonna to talk about um, uh, Cadillac. Okay. Hmm. Your mouse. But I can't get still working through the mouse. <laughs> so um, what we're going to talk about today is actually an exhibit that was open in uh, May of 19, and it really um, was a victim of the closure uh, for um, um, for the COVID. So if you've not seen the ex exhibit, um, I'll move on. Of course, uh, but again, to reiterate, I'm more than happy to have other other questions. Um, so the uh, exhibit closure is estimated to be pretty soon, um, going in through the spring and this summer. So if you've not had a chance to see it, um, uh, I encourage you to do that in the days when we are open, uh, hopefully very soon. And exciting news that um, I'd like to share is that we are going to be replacing that with a museum on Alpha or Mayo, which I think is, is going to be just um, a, a lot, a lot of fun. A lot of fun for me personally and the collectors, me personally, because I started my automotive career working for Alfa Romeo, and it's, it's certainly the most interesting, one of the most interesting and fun brands. So I look forward to, if not seeing you there, um, to come see the Cadillac uh, exhibit I'm announcing to you that we will be replacing that in short order. Um, with Alfa Romeo. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Cadillac, uh, and there's some interesting things about the Cadillac brand um, from history that uh, I, I'd like to share under the kind of guise of, you know, did you know? Uh, so the founder for Cadillac uh, was a gentleman named Henry M. Leland, and um, he acquired the assets um, of, of the company way back uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, and this is actually the second car company that he had uh, founded. And he organized the assets um, for Cadillac that were really from the Henry Ford Company. They put together a, uh, uh, started to, 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 to work on the brand Cadillac. And this was unfortunately Henry Ford's second bankruptcy before he established his, of course, now famous company. So you're talking about 1901 to 1902, um, and then Ford when uh, Mr. Leland uh, uh, created, um, took over and built the brand Cadillac. Here he is. Um, he was the um, um, certainly a pillar of, of the automotive period at that particular time. You can see that it was some time ago uh, and standing by one of his, uh, one of his first cars. Um, Mr. Leland was very interested in, 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 uh, in the car industry because he actually started his uh, professional career or his work career working for Colt Firearms. Um, the reason I bring this up and, and why it's important because at Colt uh, and in the firearms business, the, the notion of machining and tolerance and, and everything being absolutely perfect because it's a firearm, uh, is, is really the ethos of the industry. And Colt being one of the major companies, um, Mr. Leland literally apprenticed under some of the smartest people there were about working with tolerances. And I'll, I'll talk to you what that meant to Cadillac in the earlier day. But imagine in the vernacular, very precise parts that had to be interchangeable and fit um, and be safe and be able to be, be used for years and years and years. So the notion of the origin of Colt firearms uh, in the history of Cadillac is, is actually um, uh, a very important one. Um, this, as I said, is because um, Mr. Leland had experience with not only um, design, but tools and manufacturing and quality standards, as I mentioned, standards yet to be realized in the young industry at that time. Um, Mr. Leland, um, um, put together a car company that was really built um, uh, on a different design and manufacturing ethos, again, picked up from his standard at uh, work for Colt Firearms. Uh, I'll give you an example of what that means. What the, you see in the uh, picture right here is a, um, uh, a standard machine machinist tool called um, gauge blocks, or when I was um, uh, younger, um, they're called Joe blocks. 
And what these blocks are, as you see, are very, very precise um, milled pieces of machine, excuse me, pieces of metal, hard metal that has been ground with a grinder so that it is exactly um, the width of or the length of a particular measurement, for, you know, from one inches to two inches all the way down to, um, you know, eighths inches and so on. The reason for these is these gauges then became the check um, for tolerances in, in a particular piece that was being machined. So if you were machining something that needed a pre precise 30,000th of an inch, as an example, um, tolerance, you were able to pick this tool and actually slide it in there and the machinist was skilled at being able to um, determine if the uh, work that he or she, he was doing um, uh, uh, fit is because the very precise measurement was in this, in this toolbox called Joe Blocks. Um, if you've ever seen these, they're, they're quite lovely and um, I can imagine a number of enthusiasts just wanting to have a set of them in your garage just because they're, they're just absolutely terrific. Um, so what did this do for, for Cadillac? There was um, the Royal Automobile Club in, in England put together at this period of time um, a trophy called the Dewar Trophy. And this is the Royal Auto Club, of, uh, again, in England. Uh, it was a coveted award for outstanding British technical achievement in the auto industry. So call this the top engineering award uh, really in the world that had to do with honoring excellence in design uh, in the early days of the auto industry. And um, Cadillac was, um, I guess, courageous enough to, to enter this competition uh, and, uh, and compete with the best of, um, in those days, of course, probably mostly European, particularly um, 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 British automobiles. Um, there's a neat story behind um, the uh, Dewar Cup or the trophy, and that was because it was really um, created, centrally created by a, a member of parliament. So you really had some of the elite people, part of the Automobile Club, um, Royal Automobile Club putting this together. And their mission was to the motor car, which should successfully uh, complete the most rigorous performance and testing um, in the automotive industry. So precision, repeatability, that was the ethos at this time. And that was the uh, ethos that was uh, again picked up by um, Henry Leland. And um, boy, did he do well. Um, as a matter of fact, they won three uh, of these different awards. And you can see here on the screen, I won't read them all. Um, 1906 Stanley Motoring Company, 1907 Rolls-Royce, 1908 Cadillac for uh, parts interchangeability, um, Daimler, another one in Cadillac for 2012, Rover, and so on and so forth. These were all the top manufacturers in the day, Jaguar, uh, Coventry Climax, Mercedes-Benz, and um, you see those names in there, but um, uh, Leland was able to win not one but multiple awards for Cadillac up against the best designed and the best machined or best um, uh, fabricated and assembled automobiles in the world. So when you talk about Cadillac standard of the world, that uh, slogan that they still use today dates all the way back to these early days, all the way up to um, 2018 when the last award um, uh, honored VW for some powertrain excellence. So when you think about standard of the world, um, this is what that's talking about. Uh, and this is the kind of background of how Mr. Leland managed his company. Um, only three winners were American and Cadillac won two of them. So only two American brands and Cadillac won twice. So the idea of the standard of the world, which has evolved into their, their promotion or their strap line, as they say, for marketing and branding, Cadillac standard of the world dates back to this particular time. Uh, so you can see a more than 100 year ethos in excellence in, um, in fabrication and design um, that really was the backbone of Cadillac and arguably what made that brand um, one of the most popular in history and certainly um, still very strong today. Um, the whole idea of Henry Leland was to build precision in the automobiles, as I mentioned. And um, when he was doing this at a time when Henry Ford had just built his 15th millionth Model T. 
So you can imagine comparing the success of Ford with Model T and Leland with Cadillac, you're seeing two different companies focusing on two different methods for bringing cars to the market. One at the very high end and arguably still there today. And of course, a very good example um, coming from Henry Ford and Henry Ford's company today. So mass production, the same car being built again and again and again and again in a disciplined way versus very, very precise design, machining, and execution. And that's the difference between Cadillac and, um, uh, and Ford in those days. Um, so the technical innovations um, that Cadillac had, first of all, use of the Joe blocks. That's number one. 1910, they introduced the first enclosed body. And some of these innovations you may recognize as cars in the early uh, in manufacturing, but um, some things that are actually stunning from the day. Uh, imagine um, in 1912, uh, Leland brought the self-starter um, uh, to fruition in the automobile in a Cadillac. Uh, and the, in 1915, they introduced the first regular production V8 engine. So this wasn't just um, excellence in execution and man, uh, machining and manufacturing uh, and assembly, but this was, uh, things that we all take for granted today that were actually Cadillac innovations way back in the early 1900s. More of them, 1926 crank, uh, uh, crankshaft or crankcase ventilation so that the oil in, in the filter and everything would work extremely well. Um, Synchromesh silent shift um, transmissions, again, back in the day when that was unheard of. Um, and the world's first passenger car with a V16 engine as early as 1930. And in the, in the uh, not only the United States and the country, uh, excuse me, the United States and the world was going into um, a deep depression in that particular time uh, when Henry Ford's um, Model T's were selling um, like crazy. Um, Mr. Leland built the world's first passenger V16. And for those of you who've been to the museum or had an opportunity to see these, really one of the most prized collectible on um, uh, Cadillacs uh, today remains to be a V16. And we have one in our Cadillac exhibit, which belongs to um, the LeMay family collection. And um, it is a, a lovely car, uh, prominently uh, positioned in front of our big window in the north. And when you get there, just make sure you stop and take a look at this car because it's um, a very special example. Hi, hey, Scott. Can I yes. ask you a quick question? Yes. What was the impact of the depression on Cadillac's depression? Um, production, excuse me. What was the impact of the depression on Cadillac's production? <laughs> <laughs> depression. Depression, depression equals depression. You know, sometimes <laughs> depression is compressed. Um, no, that, I, I think that is, that's, a, that's a terrific question. And when you walk to the museum, you'll see these, the Cadillac um, 16, you'll see other cars that we have in our custom coach work, which were, breathtakingly expensive in this period of time because there was still um, significant wealth by a very small group of people. Um, the, the wealth wasn't being shared, um, but you, you had um, uh, uh, people that were willing to pay for the excellence in engineering and design. Um, and if you walk through the museum and say, go through custom coach works, and anytime you look at a date that talks about late 20s, 30s, going through 40s in the war, and it's a car that um, now today is worth millions, million or millions, there was a viable, although small market for what Mr. Leland was building, the people that wanted the very best. Uh, and even back then, Cadillac was emerged as, as one of the best. Hope that answers your question. By the way, um, um, I put this particular book in here um, called Freedom's Forge, uh, and it's not quite on subject for today, except for it really talks about the excellence of manufacturing and how America later on in World War II uh, went from building um, things like uh, automobiles to tanks and airplanes and ships. And it's one of the most thrilling stories, um, really with a lot of the automotive industry kind of part of that, Henry Ford was part of it, KT Keller, um, my grandfather who was head of, of um, uh, 
of Chrysler at the time and so on and so forth came together to literally win the war and the car manufacturers are part of it. So if you want to read a heroic story about the, the contribution, the excellence of um, the automobile industry and what they contributed to helping America and the allies win World War II, uh, here's a must read. Um, and it comes in audio book too. I highly recommend that. Freedom's Forge. Um, one of the things I really love to, um, uh, to look at and thought about when we designed the exhibit was the evolution of the Cadillac logo. Now keep in mind that the, that the basic theme line, uh, the mark of excellence is still used today. And a lot of the colors that came from the family um, seal um, of the founder um, evolved over a period of time. So you can see from 1906 through the 30s and the 40s and even in the 2000s, when I was uh, 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 proud to be working at, at GM at that time. And now the very new one in 2014. And, and I just figure that this is an interesting part of cars and car design because it's the, uh, if you will, the jewelry, it, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the bling that the designer spent a ton of time to affix to the car, much like um, you may be uh, extremely, um, diligent and worked a long time to figure out what your wedding ring was going to look like, because that was the mark in this case of the family, um, the family jewels, if you will. And I like looking at the at the evolution of these marks. So when you come into the exhibit, um, I would encourage you to look at um, the, the brand marks and how many there are, or in this case, hood ornaments, and what the era was and how you can imagine the era influencing the brand mark all the way up to the modern one today, which is 2014. Pausing for questions. Thank you. Um, this was really the first one, the first production car that really cemented the reputation of, of um, Cadillac. Um, I look at it um, as, as, as a stunning example of cars of the period. Um, we don't have one of these in the exhibit right now, but if you look at early cars that were built by Cadillac and can get close enough to, to see the attention to detail and the refinement and so on, you'll understand why um, uh, Cadillac really not only had the uh, name, but then the reputation and the standard of the world. Um, it's really fantastic to look at these cars, uh, including the 16 that I mentioned that belongs to the LeMay family. Uh, you'll look at that and just say, wow, I can't can't even imagine something that precise and, and, and beautiful being built in that period of time. And that's a Cadillac for you. Um, I always, um, because of my appreciation for, for advertising, um, I would direct you to, or encourage you to spend a little bit of time on the web, um, uh, surfing, uh, surfing or, or, or scanning around for, some of the great post-war advertising um, for Cadillac. And again, they were picking up the standard of the world theme line that you can see in these ads and talking about their origins, talking about the brand, talking about the lifestyle. So this was really unlike any automotive advertising uh, in the period following World War II. And there's lots of examples of this beautiful advertising um, that you can see and if you want to get a feel for the brand and its importance, and particularly after World War II, um, this uh, standard of the world advertising campaign that went on for, for many years um, is, um, that's legitimately artwork that, uh, that people frame and have on, on the walls of their office or home. So it's another kind of neat side story of an appreciation for Cadillac, and that's their post-war um, post advertising, particularly the um, uh, post-war going into the, the 50s and early 60s when, when owning a Cadillac was, um, well, it, the vernacular was, I own the Cadillac of, and fill in the blank, it could be a tool, it could be um, a fine piece of furniture, but the, the vernacular was um, to bestow um, a proud, you know, this is the best you can get um, uh, uh, word uh, for it was, my car, my uh, consumer item, my furniture, my china in my house is, is really the Cadillac of that category. Um, 
don't hear it much uh, used anymore, but it was um, quite common as, as um, uh, recently as the 60s going into 70s when you compared the best in the world with the notion of the Cadillac of. And a lot of this early advertising, if you get a chance to look at it, particularly post-war, um, is, is fantastic. I suggest you do that. And uh, it's a great way to get a feel for a Cadillac without actually having to, to buy one. <laughs> Um, May I ask another question, Scott? Yes, please. Um, what was the international interest in Cadillacs? I know we're talking it, about it specifically a lot and what was going on in America, but um, what was the international interest like in Cadillacs specifically after World War II? Um, that's, uh, that's another excellent question. And um, I can tell you clearly that the house for, or the home for Cadillac has been in North America. But... Um, to your point, and I um, spent quite a bit of time uh, in the industry in Europe, so I saw this firsthand in the late 90s going into the 2000s, is a Cadillac was an extremely uh, well-appreciated um, car, and you did see them in the city centers, uh, in, in particularly in Western Europe. Um, some of them were uh, vintage cars, if not newer cars, 50s cars um, that were imported, um, but a lot of them were imported years and years ago and, are, and Cadillac there is seen as quite prestigious, though um, I dare say a little American, um, you know, a, a bit overt, um, obviously larger, uh, bigger engines. So it was, a, it was and continues to be an extremely well appreciated American car, not to be compared with um, a car similar to that um, uh, from a European manufacturer. So the Americanness, um, the excellence in the design and the reputation um, is and continues to be well appreciated uh, in, I would say the Western world, certainly Western Europe, um, certainly in some of the key cities and, um, around the, uh, the business centers and elite centers around the world. So yeah, Cadillac and the appreciation for the excellence of it is, um, uh, is well shared around the world, although the heart of the market uh, is still here in North America. Thank you. And you get a sense of this exhibit. For those of you who have not been there, this is what you'll see. We divided it into kind of three areas, which I thought were really three different stories. Pre-war in some of this early engineering work that was just literally the best of the world and the Dewar Cup and just the reputation of the engineering and precision excellence of Cadillac. And then of course, uh, post-World War II, um, it was uh, America and America's brands uh, were riding high. And that's when you saw this whole deal, you know, that home, that consumer item, whatever it was, the Cadillac of, because it was, it was again, it seemed very, very, um, uh, the prestige was very, very high for it in the post-war period, certainly in the United States, but uh, and, and by high-end collectors um, outside of the market. Um, that the second century is the one that um, uh, I find um, a, a lot of fun because the brand is still evolving. And if you take a look at the cars today and what they're doing, um, you'll see a lot of innovation, a lot of design. You won't see um, as many of them as say a Mercedes or a Cadillac, excuse me, a BMW or uh, a Jaguar or whatever that might be, um, but the market for and the appreciation of the Cadillacs today and their unique design ethos uh, is, is um, still doing very, very well. So the pre-war cars, I can go in, but you're talking about uh, 1902, 1904, 1910, and we'll post this, um, we'll make sure that this presentation gets posted for you um, so that you could see just what the innovations and milestones were for this company back in the day. The innovations um, are in engineering and in design, uh, including say 1912, the first car maker with the world to fit an electronic self-starter um, that I mentioned that was a, um, a winner of the Dewar Trophy. So Cadillac was um, designing and innovating very early on. And if you go through the list of things that they invented um, and, and they still um, are, are a champion for, uh, it's, it's quite a thrilling last. 1915, built the first production car with a V8. 1915, 
the first synchromesh transmission, um, the first production car with a V16 engine in 1930. Um, you know, can you imagine what it was like going into what was a worldwide depression with a Cadillac 452 with a seven liter 160 horsepower V16? Uh, and it's no wonder why those are some of the most esteemed cars from the, the early days. But Cadillac has been doing this, had did it and has been doing it for years and years. Post-war is the, the time that um, a, a lot of people really enjoy because you're talking about this period now after the war, America's riding high and that's when you started seeing that for use of um, lots of V8 motors, the use of tail fins, um, uh, this whole idea about uh, standard fit all models with power steering, all models with power steering in 1954. Uh, and the Eldorado Brome flagship car from 1957, um, arguably one of the most expensive automobiles as measured by the amount of money is lost on everyone that was built by the company because they didn't do it for a profit. Uh, and if you get a chance to see and come to the museum, you will see a 1957 Eldorado Brome. You want to read a list of firsts and special things um, in, a, in a car. You, you can't get any bigger than a 57 um, Eldorado Brome. We have one. And um, the great part of the story is that one is owned by Renee Crestor, curator of collections. She's got one of these very rare cars that she's loaned to the museum. And um, if you come to the museum to see one car or two, it would be the 16 and the Eldorado Brome in the exhibit. So I encourage you to come out and take a look at those if you've not gotten a chance to do that. Um, the list of firsts are going on and on and on. First car maker to introduce um, uh, regulated heating, the uh, first car to introduce tilt and telescoping steering wheel, speed sensing power steering, um, seven liter um, front wheel drive, 340 horsepower. So the list of firsts from Cadillac, and I've listed them in this presentation. I won't go for them point by point, but uh, you think about things that we take for granted now and in, in, in more um, value added cars or excuse me, um, value sensitive cars and so on and so forth. But technology uh, tends, good technology tends to migrate from the very top of the market all the way down to it gets commoditized and eventually it democratized and you see it in more and more. But the greatest technology and the most innovative um, features tend to come from the very upper end of the market because it's expensive. And that's why a lot of the first from Cadillac um, really are now part of the industry in general. Um, and, and again, the list is, is so long, we could, we could spend an hour just talking about uh, lists of first, but I've added them to this presentation so that you can get a, get a feel for it. Goes on, anti-lock brakes, safety belts, uh, even uh, early on air cushion restraint system later on became the precursor for airbags. First manufacturer to employ electronic fuel injection. The list of firsts that we take for granted today were pioneered by a handful of companies that were forward thinking. And I would argue that um, uh, certainly the General Motors Cadillac brand um, was at the tip of that spear. Second century is something I bring up because in, in uh, 2000, the company um, had its uh, second century. Some could argue with that time period leading up to that, going through the late 90s, um, the, uh, the brand had lost a little bit of its luster. Uh, there was a lot of competition um, uh, in the marketplace. So there was a complete rethink of, of Cadillac as they went into their second century in the early 2000s. And you'll see in the next slide what that means. Um, you could argue that Cadillac's um, designs were not as innovative and prestigious as the, you might expect in the post-war going into 50s, even 60s. Um, the technology and quality weren't um, uh, up to the Cadillac standard. Um, and again, I was privileged to, to see some of this um, when I was here at this particular time. And I can say that the, the whole redo of Cadillac design and, and revamping of the brand um, was one of the uh, corporation's um, most important strategic uh, moves in this period of time. And that's why I really like talking about the second century for Cadillac. 
Um, the card that brought this um, brought this up actually um, was um, the a small car. Um, it's the it was the smallest at the time. They still build the uh, CTS, um, and it was the first car to really um, be designed with what they called at the, the time the uh, art and science design vocabulary, which meant to talk about um, the precision of science, but the emotion and the proportion and, and, the, uh, and the shapes of, of art. And even though um, the notion of the art and science design vocabulary has been talked about in different ways, in the years since 2003, if you take a look at the modern Cadillacs on the road today, and you take a look at the CTS, and maybe you've even had a pleasure to ride in one, drive one. They're, they're magnificent automobile, but the rethink of the of the brand in its second century started with this car, and you will see um, familiar. Uh, design cues and proportions and so on, um, and a lot more expressive across all of their line now. So if you think about art and science, or you think about the shapes of cars, um, what they did before and what they did with this car, I would argue that it's uh, probably one of the most significant cars uh, as we led uh, as they led into the into the second century. It's a CTS, nice driving car too. Um, Last thing I wanted to put out there, which if you missed it, I, I thought it was, um, oop, um, let, me, let me go forward here to, now doggone it, I lost it. Um, what I wanted to do was, is add two more things. If they, um, this slide here is a place that you should become familiar with and quite possibly may have an opportunity to go to, even though it's not open to the public, um, but the Cadillac Heritage Center uh, and the American, the General Motors Heritage Center and the Cadillac cars that they have there are some of the most magnificent, valuable pieces of the automobile that you will, you will see uh, in the world. We were lucky to get a the Cadillac 16 concept car out of the Heritage Center. Um, it is technically not open to the public, but they do a lot of open houses. Uh, they have, they take cars out to car shows and so on. Um, and I put that on your radar screen because if you if you want to see some of the best ever done uh, by General Motors, but certainly uh, a tribute to some of the best uh, designs and technology um, uh, in the company, thank goodness through some of the downtimes, they hung on to their treasures. And this is a, uh, a must see or at least know about place, including one of the three Firebird um, uh, science cars um, from back in the day. And you see that one's on the, uh, on the parking spot in the front there. So um, last thing I wanted to talk about here was look, I've talked about the innovation from the beginning. I've talked about leadership in technology, leadership in design. Um, uh, a reinventing or a reimagination of the brand going into the 2000s. Um, but it's not stopping there. I don't know if it was, um, uh, if it caught, caught you in the press or you might have heard about it through a blog or whatever. Um, but um, uh, the senior leadership, including their CEO, Mary Barra, excuse me, or cha Chairman Mary Barra, um, has uh, made a commitment to take Cadillac to an all electric brand. So this is not the next electric car that's coming from uh, a major car company. There's a lot of brilliant cars out there, um, a handful of electric only, Tesla being one of them. But this is the first major manufacturer that has stand up and said they're gonna make a commitment to all electric cars uh, in Cadillac, from Cadillac by the year 2025, which in car um, development period is, is, is seriously, tomorrow. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at that and look at their designs and think about the commitment they make up to and including if you have a chance to read about it in the press, if you're a dealer uh, and all of a sudden you're selling a Cadillac across the you know lines with all kinds of different sizes and powertrains and the company announces um, that they're no longer going to be embracing internal combustion engines in its future, um, that meant uh, even some dealers were rethinking their future with, with, the, with the brand. And I, I don't know how many that is, but um, literally the move to all electric will change the complexion of not only automotive space, 
but just who sells the scar and who um, potentially may not. So if you want to keep an eye on the future Cadillac, keep an eye on their designs. They're always expressive. Um, look for what they launch at a place like Pebble Beach or at a major auto show. But keep an eye on, on, this, on this big play coming in 1925 because um, I think they're, they right now are uh, made one of the biggest commitments about an all electric future than any other company. And it's, it's worth following if you're interested in that subject. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, please, in, if you can, um, um, either uh, write me um, at the museum or uh, in part, as part of this pres presentation, uh, send any questions that you have. Um, I'll uh, just sit down now and say, what do you propose is next? And how do people uh, follow up with questions and comments? That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I actually have another question. Sorry, I know I've been popping in. Um, but I was curious, though, I, I think that's really exciting to hear that Cadillac plans to go all electric. Um, I'm curious, though, what has been the consumer reaction to the announcement? Um, obviously, there's a lot of people who are proponents of electrical vehicles. They're more earth friendly, um, less pollutants and all of those wonderful things. But um, obviously, a lot of people still like their gasoline powered cars, too. So would, yeah, that's have you heard anything about the question. reaction? That's the most excellent question. And I'm glad you asked it, because in this environment, when you have companies that um, are, are going more and more electric, it used to be it was the smallest, most fuel efficient car. And of course, now you see electric and electric hybrids finding its way into exotics. So the proliferation of elect electric cars in a, you know, electric assist through you know, hybrids or direct electric is moved up and down the economic ladder. However, I, I, would, can't, I would absolutely imagine that there are people that uh, have anxiety about embracing an electric car for the future. Um, you know, range, how do I get it plugged in, you know, all the, the things that um, uh, can create angst and have for people about having an electric car or not. Now we see that changing, you know, literally year by year or month by month where more and more electric cars and more electric infrastructure um, uh, is, is becoming an easier and easier use and, and range and battery life uh, has gone up. Um, but um, it'll be interesting to see the impact of the brand. Um, I think it's a, a bold play for General Motors because this is their tip of the spear prestigious brand and the one that's really going to be embracing this for the future. Um, I've got to believe it's going to create a lot of uh, halo for the corporation and create a lot of enthusiasm for the brand, um, but we'll see. I think it's a bold move and um, uh, uh, for one, I, um, I embrace it quite a bit. Great. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eyes on that. It's very interesting awesome. and exciting I'll, news. Why don't I come back in another year and we can give them a report card? Yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, does anyone else now, since Scott is finished, if you have any questions or anything you want to share? All right, let's check this Q&A. All right, I've got a question from James Murphy. Oh, okay. So I can probably answer this one too, but um, his question is, are we going to view the Cadillacs in the museum tonight? Unfortunately, I don't know if you've noticed, but both of us are at home, so we're not in the museum. Um, but I, I don't know if you have any photos or, because um, I know you were talking about the exhibit a little bit earlier, Scott. Um, I don't know if there's any photos that we might be able to send James or that you might be able to pull up and share, but unfortunately, neither one of us are in the museum at the I, moment. Um, um... I do not have a large personal inventory or a, or a selection of those, but you can certainly go to our website. You can certainly um, 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 scan what's going on. I would say, take a look at not only um, uh, uh, search the, the exhibit itself at America's Car Museum, but take a look at Cadillac at Pebble Beach is another search string you should look at. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of really fine images coming out of the auto shows and the, and, and the individual enthusiast events like Pebble Beach and the like. Um, Goodwood is another place to, to check for that. Um, so we, we do not have um, a lot of that posted, but there is a lot of it out there. Um, if you want to write me um, at scott.keller at America's Car Museum, um, I'd be happy to do a little research and point you toward 
um, some of the places where you'd, you'd be able to, to see more and hear more. And then just as a refresher um, for all of us too, because I know that you had mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that the Cadillac exhibit will be switching out at some point to Alfa Romeo. When, how much longer, um, and I know we're not open yet, hopefully that will happen within the next couple of months, but how much longer will the Cadillac exhibit be in place before we switch um, it out to the new one? That's an excellent question. Um, at home, we're asking our states the same sales the same question because um, we've been on furlough for um, for um, near a year. Um, so we're uh, uh, speaking for myself and certainly for my colleagues, we are very anxious to get back in. Keep an eye on the website and look at when um, we open. It takes somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 120 days to realize um, a new exhibit. We've done a lot of uh, uh, preliminary work on it already. Um, so you could probably count out 90, 120 days maximum from when we open and you're, you should keep an eye out um, for, uh, for Alfa Romeo. We've done, we've done a fair amount of work on it already. We've identified the cars. It's just the unknown of, of COVIDs and, and the regulations. Um, but boy, oh boy, do we have a great lineup of cars at least identified. Um, and I'm sure we'll be able to realize those. So yeah, give us a two to three months and check back in and you can write me directly if you have any questions. So there will be some time then for folks if they really wanna see the Cadillac exhibit after we open, there will be time for them to see yes, it. Yes, yes, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things I thought about was, okay, so we're gonna talk about exhibit, uh, an exhibit that is only gonna be up for a period of time. Um, if you've been in the museum, you know, within the months before, um, COVID, you, you've already seen this, but a lot of people have not. And I figured this is the one you probably want to look at before uh, we close. Um, or excuse me, we go on to, um, uh, to the next one. And again, Alpha Male is scheduled to be the next one. Um, uh, and then uh, another one to, to be determined or to be announced um, to follow that up. Um, but yeah, go in and if you haven't seen it, see the Celine exhibit, absolutely stunning. Um, a, a, co-curated exhibit with the founder of Celine Cars, Steve Celine, and um, they're the best that, that he ever built, and, uh, and certainly come see the Cadillacs. Um, uh, and then, of course, um, Alfa Romeo. Awesome. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any final questions or thoughts or anything else they'd like to ask Scott while we have his attention? Well, um, I did put, I had a little bit of a typo, but I did put his email address into the chat box. So if you think of something later that you would like to ask him, please feel free to email Scott and he will help you out with that. Otherwise, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I know this was a different Tuesday than we normally do it with the second Tuesday of the month. So thank you for adjusting your schedules to coming this month. Um, and as I had mentioned at the top of our Zoom webinar that all the updated information for upcoming If Cars Can Talks and other educational programs can be found on our website. And if you subscribe to our newsletter, all of that information will be sent directly to your inbox. So thank you all again so much for coming. Thank you very much, Scott, tonight for um, sharing all of that information that is in your brain with us. It was wonderful and awesome. And I hope that we see all of you again soon and hopefully sooner rather than later, actually in the museum because we miss all of you. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.